it's Cara Riley and welcome to the Landscape Photography Show. This is part of the Landscape Photography theme. We have curators from the theme and we're in our night photography series which is just very exciting. Last week we had Jeff Sullivan and this week we have Michael Sheenbloom and he is an amazing Milky Way photographer, an astrophotographer, and a uh, filmer of um, uh, time lapse. So first of all, we're going to introduce our panel members. They're going to introduce themselves, and then we'll get to Michael, and he's going to tell us how to select a location, then the equipment needed, the camera um, Hi, and welcome to the <laughs> And here we have a an echo going on. So anyway, we're going to start here and we'll start with Tom. We'll go all the way over to the end here and Tom, introduce yourself. You've just gotten back from a great uh, trip and uh, let everybody know where you're from. Hi, my name is Tom Hurl and I, I live in Carmel, California. I've been a curator on the landscape photography theme. I just got back from uh, six days in the John Muir Trail and actually a second trip where we hiked up to the top of Half Dome in Yosemite. So I've been going the last two weeks, but got some good pictures. Oh, awesome. And then we'll get to our head curator and theme organizer, Margaret. Hi, everyone. I'm Margaret Tompkins. I'm an amateur photographer from uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And you can find me on Google Plus uh, pretty much in the landscape photography theme and also over in the landscape photography uh, community. Really great to be here, and I'm really anxious to learn about this night photography, something I really want to go out and do. So looking forward to it. Great. Thank you, Margaret. And now we're to Kevin in Utah. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Uh, just uh, a couple ways you can find me. Uh, my website, kevinrowphoto.com. Um, I'm on Google+, Plus, of course. I wouldn't be here, right? And then you can also find me at Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash kevinrowphoto. And um, I'm... Uh, I'm a, I do have a full-time job as a mortgage broker during the day, and um, but my, my passion and love is photography, so thanks, Cara. Great. And then we have Jim from Phoenix. Thanks, Cara. I'm an amateur enthusiast uh, based in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and uh, love landscapes, uh, both color and black and white. And I have also a day job, but uh, when I'm on Google+, Plus, I like to help Margaret out with the landscape photography theme and community. Well, that's great. And we're going to go up north to Jeff. Hi. I'm uh, up in Minnesota. I started out uh, doing a little astrophotography about 20 years ago with a 4-inch reflector telescope and uh, Nikon film camera so I'm really excited to uh, hear about advances in the digital realm and I've seen Michael's work and it's pretty spectacular so I'm looking forward to tonight's show quite a bit. Thank um, you Carl. Great. I think we all are as we're as we're evolving and, and coming up with different themes. So, last uh, episode um, fourteen, we had Jeff Sullivan with us, and Michael was in the comments watching, and uh, we were going through and looking at his photographs, and they were amazing. And one of them, I think, Michael had five thousand pluses, and like. 2,000 reshares, and he's just gone from someone who just got started here at Google+, Plus, and, he, and as we had our conversation, he's been here about three months. He has 93,000 followers, and as we discussed it, it's all about the content. His photography is amazing, just like uh, Jeff mentioned, and he's just uh, finished a 
several months from school, and uh, he does uh, time-lapse photography. He's a filmer, and um, while he was out filming, he decided to start taking some still shots, and this is how it evolved. And he really described himself as an organic photographer, and uh, so uh, we're really, really excited to have Michael here and share with us um, how he sets up, decides where he's going to go, what kind of equipment he's going to use, and then how he edits the shots. So Michael, thanks for being on the show, and we're all very excited. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Shamloom. I am, a, I guess, nightscape photographer, landscape photographer, and a uh, filmmaker based out of uh, Southern California. So, um... Should I just dig right into this then? Yeah, start off with uh, the locations. We talked about locations, how you decide where it is that you're going to do a night shoot. So uh, locations, I mean, I guess the first thing to consider would be finding the dark sky. Um, and for anyone who hasn't really you know, been out too far away from a city, um, the easiest thing to do is find the closest, uh, you know, wildlife preserve or, or uh, you know, state park. Um, there's also, here, I'm going to share my screen, um, there is also a, um, one sec, there's also a little app, I don't know if you guys can see, it's the Dark Sky Finder, mm -hmm. and um, it's not you know, really accurate, but it gives you a rough idea of um, the dark skies around your area. And I think this is, um, I think this is for the United States. I think they also have, yeah, they have parts of, uh, of Europe and some other areas. But, um, you know, I mean, if you're living in another country and you just type in the name of where you live, and dark skies, or the name of where you live, and astrophotography, you'll probably be able to find some good dark skies. Um, but, you know, I use these different um, websites and, and whatnot to find, um, you know, kind of the, the dark sky that I'm, uh, I'm looking for. And, and uh, you know, it kind of depends on the foreground, too. But when you're just getting started, and all you want to do is find the Milky Way, the best thing to do is just to go away from the city. Um, you know, that's the, the easiest thing that I would say. Um, I'm going to share my screen once more. And, uh, we had some of those shots, um, Michael, where you, uh, uh, the dinosaur park and big city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have those right here. Um, okay. So here's a few, here's like four different locations. Um, I just found these off offline. I'm not sure whose photos they are. They're kind of a little snapshotty, but um, you know, you'll get the idea. This is McWay Falls in Big Sur. Um, I have a shot from here um, that I'm going to show you guys. Uh, you know, what's great about uh, this place is, you know, it's a coastline, but it's, it's really clear, beautiful dark skies, um, you know, no close cities. I mean, I think the closest city is either Monterey or San Luis Obispo. Uh, this place is just amazing. The only issue with this place is the marine layer comes in, and uh, it can, you know, be really hard to deal with. But if you do end up coming to Big Sur on a clear night, it's it's just gorgeous. Um, right here, this is San Inez. Um, I really like San Inez because not many people know how good the skies are there. It's kind of underrated. Uh, you know, people travel so far in California to go to places like uh, the Eastern Sierras when, you know, San Inez really isn't far from L.A. It's only an hour and a half, give or take, from Los Angeles, and you can get really... I think we're still on Big Sur. Oh, it is? Yes. Uh, I see the new one, Kara. I do, too. Oh, okay. I do, too. Okay. Let okay. me know if it's, right. if it's lagging, but, um, yeah, anyways, this is uh, San Inez really great area. Um, let me know if this pops up. It's, uh, okay, yeah, now we've got the road showing. Okay. Um, so this photograph right here is uh, of the... I have a shot of some dinosaurs. 
yes. with the Milky Way in the background. And these are actually the dinosaurs, but taken during the daytime. Um, they're real dinosaurs, real sculptures. A lot of people think the photo is CGI or something, but it's actually real. Um, and this is right in the middle of the Anza Borrego Desert, which is, you know, uh, a really great premier dark sky location in Southern California. Beautiful desert landscapes. Um, and I've actually spent uh, the past week photographing it uh, quite a lot. Um, and then the fourth good location I have here that I like to shoot, uh, this is uh, Bristlecone Pine in the Bristlecone Pine Forest, uh, deep in the White Mountains, uh, California. It's pretty close to Bishop, California, and it's, um, you know, one of the darkest skies I've ever seen. Um, as far as, you know, picking the location, it just really depends on, on where you live. You know, I mean, it, it, it really varies. But California, if you live in California, I mean, you know, there's some really amazing dark skies, and they're, you know, pretty easy to find. That, that shot that you had, Michael, with the um, road going through it, that's the one that went viral with the Milky Way over that road. And I think it's just really exciting how it's just you pick during the day, you pick these sites and then come back and then create it. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, now the equipment that you take with Yeah, you. I have a camera bag right here. Um, one sec. It's kind of a big guy, but um, I have all my gear in here. Uh, right now, it's it's actually set up for astrophotography because I was shooting astrophotography last night. Um, so in here, I have pretty much just the usual, a bunch of batteries. Um, the cameras that I'm using are, I have a uh, Canon 5D Mark III which is really great for astrophotography, um, you know, great uh, low light sensitivity, uh, really good ISO control. What I've been using lately, though, is this uh, 60, which is actually, supposedly, it's like a stop better. Uh, you get a stop more of light when shooting dark skies. So I've been using it a lot, and I really like it, and it's cheaper, too. Um, I think you could pick this up for, like, maybe two grand, something like that. Um, the lenses that I use for uh, night sky photography, uh, actually, I have it on this camera. It's the Rokinon 14 millimeter, um, 2.8. It's a manual lens, uh, so you know there's no autofocus, uh, but it's really nice. It's only like three hundred dollars. Um, you know, it works great for all the really wide images. And then what I use for all those panoramas, like the galaxy over the road shot that you guys saw, the, the really wide one, um, that's using uh, this lens, which is the Sigma 20 millimeter 1.8 lens, which I think this runs five or six hundred dollars. Um, just a really awesome lens. The only thing is, uh, you can't really shoot it anywhere past 2.8. After 2.8, you get coma, which is a uh, you know, it's where the stars start to bow on the edges, and you get these weird discs. Um, but at 2.8, this lens looks really stunning. Um, as far as other gear, I mean, I have all the essentials. I have, like, an Allen wrench. Uh, I have, you know, like, an LED light. Um, I have, like, a mini tripod. This is, like, a super mini tripod that you can put the camera super low to the ground. Um, big filter kit. Yeah. Now tell us about the t-shirt. Uh, the t-shirt <laughs> method. Um, so <clears throat> I don't the use... Light. He, has, he uses the LED light. Tell us how you use the light with the night photography. Yeah, I don't really do a lot of light painting. I'm not really a light painter. I like to, you know, take, uh, you know, I like to just get it, you know, right with one photo. But a lot of times that doesn't work, so I'll combine exposures. But from time to time, I'll do a little bit of light painting. And what I like to do is uh, take an LED light or even, like, the light on my cell phone um, and use the flashlight app or something like that. Uh, it's turning on. And, uh, and then I take, like, a white T-shirt, and I'll just, like, put the white T-shirt over the light, and that diffuses it a lot. And you can reflect a lot, uh, a lot of... Um, you know, nice soft light into the foreground. 
Um, and then I'll just walk around the scene. I'll walk around the scene a few times. I'll flash in different areas. A lot of times I'll flash up higher rather than lower because if you flash lower, that's when you get the really spotty light on the foreground. And if you uh, if you shine it a lot higher, you get a lot more light spreading to the background. Um, that's the method for light painting, but uh, there's a million different ways of light painting. I don't do a lot of it, but from time to time I like to light paint. Um, another great app, actually, if you want to find the Milky Way, this is a great app. Um, it's called Starwalk, and you can get it for your iPhone or iPad. I'm not sure if you can get it on other smartphones, um, but it's a uh, it's an app where you can actually see the galaxy. And if you move the uh, the phone around, it'll show you kind of where the moon is and where you know kind of where you are in conjunction to, you know, the planets. Like, if I'm turning it around, it's going to show a view of the stars and constellations. And the cool thing is I can map out where things are going to happen. I can click. There's some buttons on here where you can click and change the date or the time. So you can, you know, say, I'm going to look west. And then you can, you know, put it up west change the time and see what's going to change while you're facing in that direction. Um, the other cool thing is it tells you all the, all, all the moon phases, uh, the sun, um, you know, rising and setting times. Um, it's great. It's a fantastic app. And that's, you know, when I first started uh, doing all the astrophotography and I was curious, you know, I wasn't really sure, you know, where the Milky Way is going to rise, what's going to happen, what time is it going to rise. This was you know, a lifesaver, because I can, as long as I know the direction where I want to face, or, you know, the direction kind of where I want to shoot, uh, you can even do this from your house, you know, because you just say, well, I want to shoot east, or I want to shoot west, and then it'll tell you what's going to happen. Um, it's perfect. That's great. I have, we have people talking in our event here, and someone said, whoever has the Facebook going with the sound alerts, it's very distracting. <laughs> Presumably one of the hosts, I keep looking at my Facebook. So anybody have Facebook open, let's close it up. <laughs> it's not me. I don't think it's me. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, John Dickinson, for letting us know that we have stuff going. We we appreciate it because we get gremlins in here all the time, and unless somebody tells us, sometimes we don't know those things. I have a quick question for Michael. Yeah. Sure. Um, do you find that you uh, shoot with a new moon or a no moon up more often, or doesn't it matter to you so much anymore? You know. I was talking with a friend about that. Um, I don't know if new moon is a whole lot darker than just a moonless sky, you know? Um, it's, I don't know, I, I feel like I've been out on new moon, I always try and go out on new moons just because it's like an event, you know? You, you get the whole night to just shoot, no moon, um, you know, no moon interruptions at all. And it, you know, it's, it feels it feels really dark because we're out there and we're saying that it's going to be really dark because there's no moon. But you know, I've been out other nights where you know the moon has just set and the sky is just as dark, um, you know, as a night with no as a as a new moon. Um, you know, I do like to shoot on new moons though because it just gives a lot of opportunity to experiment with you know, the Milky Way rising and the Milky Way being in different positions of the sky because you have so much time. You have essentially the whole night to shoot, which is super awesome, and I, I really like that. Um, I'm not sure if it's a whole lot darker than just a good moonless sky, though. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Oh, good. Well, I think you have some pictures for us to go through, and you can yes, tell us what the different skies are. Well, what what you did, how you shot them, and um, how you prepared to for them. Yeah. So um, I guess we'll start off um, with this first image, which uh, this image was taken in the Anzaborrego Desert. Um, this is one of the sculptures that I was talking about. It's a uh, you know sculpture of a dinosaur. And um, 
the skies in in the Anza Borrego, this specific area is called Borrego Springs, and it's just amazing. You know, really clear, gorgeous night skies. Um, Borrego Springs is an actual, uh, it's an international dark sky community. Um, you know, so they they're not they don't have a bunch of lights. Uh, you know, unnecessary lighting everywhere. So it's really crazy. You know, you can be right in the town center and see beautiful Milky Way. Um, and this really isn't taken that far from Borrego Springs Town Center. Um, you know, this was taken on a dirt road, uh, you know, right out of the town. And uh, basically to get this photo, I just, um, you know, I, I used that light painting technique on the dinosaur with the T-shirt and the cell phone um, just to get, you know, a nice exposure on the dinosaur and then, you know, Everything just kind of fell in place. This is only one photo, uh, not multiple. And um, settings. So how for, far how far away were you from that dinosaur? Because you showed us, you know, when we started out, the, the, here's what it looked like mm -hmm. in the daylight. So how it's, far away were you to get that so that the light on your T-shirt that doesn't seem like a very powerful light, but you sure did light the dinosaur up. You got to remember too. I'm shooting at such high ISO, and I'm shooting at such a great exposure. I'm doing 30 second exposures, f 2.8. This one's ISO 6400, so any amount of extra light is going to be seen by the camera. Um, so even with the dimmest amount of light, even with just a cell phone light, you're seeing actually a good amount of um, you know uh, luminance coming into the photo. Um, I don't know how far I was from the dinosaur. I, I wasn't too far. Um, you know, I wasn't, you know, like a hundred feet away. I, I was, I was fairly close because this, this is fourteen millimeters. Um, you know, so it's a really wide, uh, you know, point of view. I, I'd say, let's see, how far was I? Maybe, uh, maybe like twenty feet, thirty feet at most from the dinosaur. I'd so say. Michael. Michael, how, how often do you have to convince people you didn't Photoshop in the dinosaur? <laughs> you know? All the time. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I, you know, um, I have, even people who really like the photograph, you know, they share it and they're like, this is, you know, we really like the way this looks. Um, and then I'm like, yeah, you know, and then, and then they're, they're like, so how did you, how did you Photoshop or how did you paint the dinosaur in? And I was like, oh. No, it's it's real. It's a sculpture. It's out there. Yeah. Um, How do you avoid star trails? Basically, to avoid star trails with this type of stuff, I just I never shoot past thirty seconds. Um, thirty seconds is kind of like that point where the stars are just starting to trail. Um, if we zoom into this one, oh. This isn't exactly the most high res image, but you know, if if we zoom into this image, the stars aren't really trailing too much. Um, but you know, if we were to go to like 35 seconds or 40 second exposures, we would see the star trail more. Um, and the cool thing about shooting all these wide lenses is you don't see the trail as much when you're shooting with a wide lens. Like if I was shooting with a 50 millimeter, there would already be a lot of trail in these stars. But since I'm shooting at 14. Um, you know, it's such a wide perspective that not much is really moving in the frame. So, uh, is this noise processing done in camera, or do you do heavy noise processing out of the camera afterwards? Um, I I did a test of the the long exposure noise reduction in camera last night actually, and I didn't see a difference at all with uh, hot pixels and uh, noise. I I did five or six different test images and it really didn't affect the frame at all so I actually turned the noise reduction the or at least the long exposure noise reduction off when I'm shooting because it's just added exposure time um, so all of this is done in post through Lightroom and you know sometimes a little bit of uh, Photoshop as well it's, it's all most of its Lightroom to get rid of the noise though okay the color balance. Yeah, I, I would assume that your your LED on your phone has got a lot of blue in it, but your dinosaur doesn't doesn't look blue. Yeah, um, I think this one was shot at tungsten, so the image was already a little bit blue. Um, here's the thing about 
the dinosaur not looking blue. This dinosaur in real life, if we scroll back to this image, is really red. Wow. Um, extremely red. So if we were to use a blue light on that red, you know, it's going to tone down the color and make it a little bit more, more neutral. So in a way, if this, was, if this dinosaur was actually, like, yellow or green, um, this, you're right, it would look really blue. But since the dinosaur was so red to begin with, uh, the blue light actually helped cool down the tones. Okay. Now, I, we have some conversation going on here. Um, Jeff Morris has given us the link to learn more about the statues, so we'll have that in the summary. But there was a question um, from Jim Donnelly. 600 per year focal length, how many seconds can you shoot for without a star trail? Um, wait, repeat the question. 600 your focal length equals how many seconds can you shoot for without a star trail? 600, like oh. 600 millimeters? Like yeah, 600 with a flash mark. Divide 600 by your focal length, and that gives you how many seconds oh. you can shoot. <laughs> so oh, like, okay. It's not oh. a question. He's, he's telling us something. Okay. <laughs> no, what I don't like, like math. 100 millimeters, you know, 600 divided by 100 millimeters would be six seconds you can shoot. Yeah. That's okay. That's, I'd never right. heard that. That's good. Great tip, Jim. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. So um, if there's no more questions, I'm just going to go ahead and get to the next image. Um, just so a this summary image. on that one. It was um, your ISO is 6400, f2.8, and a 14 millimeter at 30 seconds, right? Yes, exactly. That's the setting. Okay. Great. So this image right here... Um, this one is taken in San Ynez uh, on top of Mount Figueroa. And this right here is actually one of the brightest uh, night skies I've ever seen. Um, you know, one of the most brilliant Milky Ways I've really witnessed with my own eyes. Me and my friend got out of the car um, after, you know, the hour and a half drive, and we were stunned, absolutely shocked how bright it was, because I've seen the Milky Way in places like Death Valley, I've seen it in Canyonlands, Utah, Wyoming, I've seen it, you know, in a lot of really great uh, dark sky locations, but this specific night was amazing because the marine layer, this fog on the right side, uh, you know, was basically taking over the entire coastline, so it was covering up all the cities, it was covering up Los Angeles, uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, just all of the nearby cities. And the really the only thing above the fog was the mountains that were over about 5,000 uh, feet. So almost all of the nearby light pollution got cut out. The only light pollution visible in the image is, uh, is some light pollution from the eastern cities, uh, Santa Clara, which you can see... Uh, the kind of the red lines towards the horizon. Uh, but this is a, a panorama of, I believe, I think this is about 12 images, uh, six, six vertical with two rows. Mm. Um, and I'd say this is about a 180-degree view of the Milky Way. Um, you know, just really... I don't know, I really liked the way this one came out, especially since, you know, it's it's really rare to get the sky to be this dark unless you're in a place like Death Valley. I mean, you know, it was really stunning. All these colors in the Milky Way that you see in the galactic core, um, you know, and throughout, they're all natural. I mean, that's, you know, that's the way they, they pretty much came out in the camera with a little bit more enhancement. And... Um, you know, to get the foreground exposure, uh, basically all I did... The, the cool thing about doing these panoramas is you have a lot more resolution to work with. So you can bring up these exposures, you know, in the grass and in the rock, and they look less noisy because you're, you know... I mean, you're working with an image that's, you know, at least, like, 40 megapixel, you know, 50 or 60 megapixels. So it, it, it tends to look a lot better when you're working with these panoramas rather than a still shot. Michael, are you using any type of panoramic ball head, or are you just kind of eyeballing it? I've been asked that a lot. I just eyeball it. Um, you know, I 
I see pretty well in the dark now. I don't I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I you know <laughs> my eyes have adjusted Practice. to it. Night eyes, night eyes. But um, but I you know when I'm doing these panoramas, I tend to give you know at least forty to fifty percent overlap. Um, you know, enough room for the images to be able to overlap uh, and for Photoshop to be able to say, you know, hey, this image goes with this image just as this image goes with this image, um, you know. And the the reason I, I'm using the Sigma 20 millimeter lens on this panorama, and the reason I'm doing that is Photoshop has a really tough time with uh, edge distortion. It has a really tough time you know, working with 14 millimeter or 16 millimeter files. Um, when you're working with 20, there's not a lot of distortion. There's still a little bit on the sides, but not enough for it to really be a problem. Uh, most of my images stitch in Photoshop when they're shot at 20 millimeters and when I have a good amount of overlap. Michael, was some, this shot on... Go sorry. Oops, sorry. Was this shot on your full frame uh, or your crop sensor camera? Um, I have uh, the, both the 6D and the 5D Mark III are oh, full frame cameras. Um, yeah, so this was shot full frame, and I think you know, obviously, I would need a lot more images if this is a crop body, um, just because 20 millimeters would be so much, you know, yep. it'd be a lot longer. Now we we have some conversation going on here. Tommy Lynn K K W um, wanted to ask Michael, can mm -hmm. we use daylight in white balance setting? That's a good question. You know, you can. Um, it's really up for debate. You know what night photographers use as their white balance. I personally like tungsten. Um, I really like the blue cast in the sky. I like the images to look a little cooler. And then a lot of times I'll go back and tone that down uh, in Lightroom. You know, I'll bring back a little bit, a little bit more of the warmth. But you know, just out of camera, I like the blue cast. But I know a ton of night uh, night star photographers that use uh, daylight, and they love it. You know that they're. You know, because you you can you can really change the white balance in post without an issue as long as you're shooting uh, full raw files. Well, thank you. And Tommy Lim also reiterated that it's actually the rule of 600 in nightscape. <laughs> so about the feet. All right. <laughs> so we'll go on to the next. <laughs> okay. So um, this image was shot actually on the same night as the previous image um, in a similar location. Um, uh, it, it was actually taken a little bit further up the mountain, and me and my friend went on, you know, I think it was like a 20 or 30 minute hike, uh, you know, and we saw the fog bank in the distance with, you know, these, these few trees. And, and the Milky Way was just in a really nice spot, so I decided to stop and snap a nice picture. Uh, so this is just one exposure uh, shot at 20 millimeters. Um, you know, there's no wide panoramas. This is just one single shot. And so what was your, what would your ISO and your um, F be on this? F -stop? Yeah, for, the, for this one the ISO is 3200, um, F-stop 2.8, which is usually I'm using 2.8. Sometimes I go 3.2 depending on, you know, the way the stars look. But usually it's f2.8, and uh, this one is at 30 seconds. Oops. Um, are we losing you? Me? Uh, do you hear audio out there? Have anybody? Yeah. yeah. Yep, he's here. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm under. I, I'm. It's going in and out for me. But there's a question from Tyler Carl. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, since you are doing a panorama of the Milky Way, do you do anything to deal with the fact the stars are moving, or do you just deal with it? That's another uh, debate that that actually me and my friend Jeff, who's who is watching right now, we were having this conversation last night. Um, as long as you work fairly quick, as long as you're shooting the, you know, if you wait like 30 minutes in between a shot, your panorama won't stitch. You know, the stars have moved too far. But the thing is, um, the thing that you have to consider is, you know, when you're shooting super wide, the stars aren't moving that much. And if you work fairly quickly, you know, you're doing 20 to 30 second exposures, and you need about 12 of them. And really, that's not, you know, that's not that much time. 
the other thing, uh, a lot of a lot of the time I shoot um, the sky images first, so I'll do uh, the shots in rows rather than in columns. So instead of taking one image and then going down and shooting, you know, the image that would be under that image, I go, you know, uh, from side to side with the photos, and the stars you know, they don't move, they, they all move as one. The whole sky moves as one, you know, so if you take images side by side, they're still going to stitch. The stars aren't, like, you know, changing drastically. They're still going to be in the same place. They're just going to have shifted slightly. Um, so it's not really a huge issue when you're dealing with these panoramas. I would say just don't, you know, forget that you're doing an exposure and go do something else because then your panorama might not mm -hmm. stitch. I, I think that might have just answered Howard Hoffman's question, but I'll read it so in case it didn't clarify. He said, if you are tracking a six-shot pano for 30 seconds each, do you have trouble aligning the images? And I think you just answered that, right? Yeah, um, it's not really a problem. Um, the cool thing, here's, here's a little secret. That's not really a secret, but um, the cool thing about these star panoramas is, you know, a lot of times when you stitch a panorama in Photoshop during the daytime, you know, maybe Photoshop gets confused because of the light, uh, you know, the sun changing, you know, you, you're changing angles. The cool thing is you're shooting this all without, you know, moonlight, so the whole sky is, you know, it's, it's the same, it's pretty much the same tone, um, and it, it, it makes it really easy for Photoshop to be able to read these files, and the really cool thing is, you know, our, all the our universe and, and the stars are so, it's such an elaborate formation, you know, of the galaxy. And Photoshop always knows what to do with these stars because what Photoshop is doing in the Automate program is it's running off the of numbers. It has no clue what it's seeing. It just knows the numbers. And it knows all the little changes in pixels and pixel density in your image. Um, and when it's working with stars, stars are such an elaborate formation that it always knows, you know, it literally always knows how to stitch these panoramas. That's what I found, at least. Well, great. Well, we have a lot coming, and we have about um, ten more minutes where we can go through these photos. So, so um, this is the next one, and it's in m one of my favorite places uh, called the Bristlecone Pine Forest um, in the White Mountains. And it's a really amazing place, um, really beautiful. Uh, these beautiful old trees, um, you know, they're like uh, four, five thousand years old. Uh, you know, some of the oldest, you know, living things on our planet, and they're they're just beautiful and gorgeous. And I have a few more bristlecone pine uh, shots in here, but I really like this one because uh, when we were there, the ground was so bright. Uh, this white rock that you're seeing in the foreground was being illuminated from just star glow, and um, this this image, this you know normal exposure of 30 seconds ISO 3200 f 2.8, you know I was able to pull out so much detail from one raw file, um, and, you know, and and I really I really enjoyed that. I did some you know selective kind of color and toning. I think this image is a little cooler than my usual images, but, um, you know, I, I just added those tones to give a feeling to the image. Gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael, how do you manage to find these spectacular places that don't have airplanes and satellites flying <laughs> your images? I don't know if I necessarily find the places. I think Photoshop has something to do with that. No, um, you know, for this image, I don't think I had to Photoshop out any planes. But you know, when I'm doing these big panoramas or I'm shooting in, you know, in the way of like, like an uh, what is it called? Um, you know, like a like a uh, an air traffic. Um, I don't know what it's called, but you know, where like planes are traveling across the sky, like like they're uh, sure. Yeah, uh, you know. Basically, I don't really have to deal with a lot of planes, but when I deal with the big panoramas, I always have to Photoshop at least, you know, three or four out. I mean, they're, they're usually pretty small. Um, you know, they're, they're really not a problem to get out. You, you can use, like, five or six different methods of getting those out of the frame. I always Photoshop them out, though. I, I hate having uh, uh, plane lines and, and, you know, plane trails in the image. 
Michael, yes. quick, quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, that shot, on that particular shot, uh, did you just have to do several shots to estimate what your EV range was, or were you able to get enough information from the histogram off the camera, say from the first one, that you knew what you were doing and, and how to proceed? Yeah, um, this image, it was just one exposure, and, you know, we were standing out there, and it was so bright. It almost felt like there was moonlight shining on the rock. So naturally, you know, even from just my field of vision, uh, you know, from what I can see with my own eyes, I knew that this exposure, you know, I, I would be able to retain enough detail uh, in the foreground. You know, there's a lot of really dark foregrounds. I'll, I'll show you guys one foreground, which I really had to bring up, but... You know, for these bristlecone pine shots, the foreground was just lit up perfectly, just beautifully. Okay, so I'm going to continue to the next shot. Michael, since one of your lenses at least is a manual lens, how do you find it's it's best to focus? Given yeah, that's, a good, that's a good question. Oh. I should have covered that. Um, so to focus... Uh, a lot of people use Infinity. I don't really like to trust Infinity. I don't you, think it really yeah, you works. Can't, you can't count on that. Yeah. What I like to do is um, <laughs> it's either really easy or it's really hard. Uh, yeah. If there's any lights you know, far off in the distance, uh, I go through in live view and I fine tune. You know, I, I, I magnify the live view to like you know, 10x. Um, you know, and I do really fine focus on like a light in the distance and that's you know fairly easy to do uh, if there's no lights like in a place you know the bristlecone pine forest uh, where this shot was taken you know I had to actually go in and look for a very bright star and focus I actually do go in live view and focus on the stars okay thanks can't, can't you just use a hyperfocal distance yeah you can I just I don't like math <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a very fair answer. <laughs> now we have another question from Tommy Lynn K W. Mm -hmm. Another question to Michael: How do you deal with heavy dew when you are shooting outside at night? Do you have any dew heater on your lens? Yeah, um, you know, I know I know a lot of uh, you know this. This is a really good question because when you're shooting time lapse you have the camera shooting these photos for like three hours at a time so naturally you know the lens does uh, acquire a lot of moisture um, you know when you're shooting you know especially up in a place like this up the mountain um, you know you can use like hand warmers I've heard work really well um, a lot of times if I'm shooting time-lapse I'll go through and I will wipe down the lens in between shots um, every once in a while you know like I'll go out every you know, like 15 minutes, just and make sure, uh, you know, the lens, you know, is still uh, clear and clean. Um, and same goes for the astrophotography. I'm, if I'm doing these shots, I just make sure before I take the shot, you know, that I've wiped down and cleaned my lens. Uh, and, it, you know, that does the trick usually. And um, we want to tell Tommy Lin thank you. He is from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and it is very late or very <laughs> early in the morning for him to stay up. And he's telling you thank you so much, uh, Michael. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, so this guy, this is a, another panorama. Uh, I think this one might be 12 images again. Um, this is you know, probably one of my favorite panoramas of, you know, the Bristol Cone Pine Forest. Uh, this is actually the same location as the previous image. Um, a little bit different processing. The, these colors, you know, they look almost rainbow. Uh, and it's surprising because these colors are fairly natural. All I really had to do was boost them slightly. Um, the orange on the horizon is, you know, kind of this light pollution from, you know, nearby towns and cities. And then that green hue that you're seeing is air glow uh, on top of that. And then that goes, you know, that air glow fades into the natural blues of the sky. Um, and the colors of the Milky Way were just gorgeous on this specific night. Another question from Howard Hoffman. For the photo on the screen, how did you get the entire ground lit up? Yeah, uh, so it goes as the same thing as the last image. Um, this place, this specific area, 
was so bright. I, I really can't tell you guys how bright. I could, you know, walk around and see with no moon at all. I could walk around and know exactly what I was stepping on. It was that bright. Um, and really all I had to do was take, um, you know, go in, in, in post and just bring up the shadows slightly, you know, bring up the shadows, mm -hmm. uh, and I was able to retain so much detail, you know, to where this foreground barely has any noise. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this really all depends on the location. The next image I'm about to show you guys, pitch black. Uh, pitch Michael, black in, an, in an image like this, does the wind ever give you some problems with the motion on branches of those um, trees? Yeah, it does. Um, these trees are so sturdy. These trees, you know, they've they're 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 rock solid. Um, so I didn't have any issues. Uh, it was also a very calm night. You know, I've been really lucky shooting this type of stuff, and uh, most of the time it's pretty calm. And unless you're shooting a, a really, you know, unless you're shooting something like ferns or or grass or uh, you know, large swaying trees. It doesn't really become an issue, but I was shooting time lapse um, a while ago of some beautiful, I think they were palm trees, and the wind was really strong, and I wasn't really able to capture the form of the palm trees due to the wind. So it really, yeah, it depends on the night, but most of these, most of these shots, um, the wind hasn't really been a huge factor. Well, we're, we're going through. <laughs> now, here's what we're going to have to do is have plan B is going to have him back for the editing because we're not even through all these wonderful shots here. So we'll I'll go a little right quicker. This. So um, this one, this is just uh, McWay Falls in Big Sur. Um, it's a, uh, this is two shots. So I had to go through and Photoshop in an image of the path that was a lot brighter. Uh, I believe the image of the path was about five minutes um, of just the camera being set on bulb. And then I took an exposure, a normal 30-second exposure for the sky. And then I went in, in Photoshop and did a very, you know, um, a, a very slight blend so that the images... You know, so so that it doesn't look like two shots combined, so that it actually looks like one, you know, coinciding shot. Um, so this is a good example of foreground. You know, I could not see anything. I tried to, you know, push the ISO, and I tried to, you know, do a lot to to make the image brighter. And literally, the only thing that the camera could pick up in the foreground was the whitewash down by the uh, waterfall. That's all. Everything else was pitch black. So uh, if there's no more questions, I'm going to continue on to the next shot. Um, so this is shot in San Ynez. Um, it's one of my favorite spots uh, down kind of in the valley off of a road called Armor Ranch Road. Um, this is also the location where I shot that huge galaxy panorama, which is uh, in a few photos. Um, this is... All, all, uh, or t these two images, these, uh, this one and the next one, are both uh, blends of two different exposures to get a little bit more light on the foreground. Because uh, this specific location, um, there wasn't a lot of light hitting the foreground com comparatively to the bristle cone pine forest. Um, this one didn't require a lot of Photoshop other than that. Uh, the Milky Way was extremely bright, extremely colorful. Um, it was really awesome to shoot, but the foreground did need to be brought up or else it would have been a silhouette. Um, mm -hmm. And this next shot is essentially the same thing. Um, this one I actually brought up the foreground a lot. Uh, I took, um, I think, a, 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 a lot longer of an exposure for this specific shot. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the thin layer of haze in this specific photograph, um, that thin layer of haze is from L.A., uh, Los Angeles. So um, this is uh, that one shot with the road and the galaxy. Um, this shot took a huge amount of planning. It's actually funny, these two shots, if you look at this shot, the this shot that we just looked at, and you look at this one, 
that previous shot is actually in the right side of the composition. Um, if you took like a small square from the right side of this image, you would get close to what you saw in that previous image. Um, anyways, this panorama is, you know, it's really large. I think this one was like 20 images. Um, and it took a lot of planning to get the right road angle and to just get the Milky Way to be in the perfect spot. Um, but I was really happy with the way this one came out. This one barely required any Photoshop besides the actual panorama stitch. Were you able to use your app to figure out the position of the Milky Way in this picture, or was that still a bit of uh, just a seat of the pants? Yeah, um, I, I did use the app, and I, I, I was looking on a map to see what road actually faced the right direction. Um, I think this road, this road was actually facing south. Um, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it just like everything really came together for this specific photograph. I had been wanting to do the road shot for so long, um, and it was tough to find a road that literally went in the perfect spot. Um, you know, where I was able to get the Milky Way, you know, to go like to arc right, you know, directly over it. But um, and yeah. the traffic on the road. I know. That, that's another thing about this road. It's a residential road, and there's barely any cars on it. But I was really careful, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was always looking back every, you know, in between every shot just to make sure, you know, there weren't any headlights. The cool thing about this spot is you can see the headlights for, you know, like a mile. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you can see lights so far on this road that, uh, it's, it, you know, it really wouldn't have been that much of an issue. This is the one you have over 5,000 pluses and 1,700 shares. So this, everyone likes this. Yeah, yeah. This one, this one was a really fun image. I was super excited about it. If anyone has any questions about this specific one, uh, let me know because this is actually our last image um, before the editing. Cool. Well, I think what we're going to have to do, we're coming to the end of our hour show, and um, Michael, you were so kind to say you're going to come back. <laughs> I think that will give people a reason to come back um, for the editing, because uh, when it gets to be an hour and a half, it, it, the show gets to be a, a little bit long. So. Yeah. Um, if you unshare your screen there, we can see you and and uh, kind of go through that. We'll look forward to the editing on another another evening then. Yeah. Yes. And there were some questions that we didn't get to, so I think some of the the people watching will also love to see another show where you're doing your edits. Cool. Um, did you Great. have one? I, I see you were talking to Tori Voigt. I didn't see that question, Jim. Did Did you want to ask, Michael? Uh, no, actually, I didn't see any questions before. Oh, okay. And then he said, are you seeing this? Okay. Okay, great. All right. So, um, we where our our problem with Michael is that sometimes he gets called out on these, and I can't say the names, but he's doing some very big deal time lapse photography. And uh, as soon as these commercial comes out, you will be the first to know um, who he's been working for, and uh, that's pretty amazing. You know what's going on there, and we'll have you back for editing. I'm going to plant this for August 13th, but and you don't have to commit now, but we will be putting in our next uh, show notes uh, when we'll have you back for the editing. Because yeah, I let's, think let's wait on the dates. I think we had that okay. one planned, but we'll, okay, that one's we'll check That's our fine. calendar out. Cool, okay, and if anyone's... Great. You know, if anyone out there is curious to see the editing process, you know, maybe not uh, quite as advanced as what we're going to talk about the next time, but I do have a, a tutorial uh, online on YouTube free, um, which will teach you kind of the basics of editing the Milky Way. But you know what we can do is go a little bit more in depth and talk about a lot of this stuff. Um, good. Can know. we put a link to that then on our show notes? That would be good. Yes, we've got that. We and we had some um, of of his information on our event actually. And I think that uh, one thing that any of our listeners out there, if you would like to be in the loop 
for all the things that Michael is going to be coming up with because he's going to be doing some night workshops, have some different tutorials. It's uh, Shane Bloom photo at yahoo.com. That will be in our show notes. But in order for you to get email updates, uh, obviously follow him on, uh, on Google+, Plus. but you can be on his mailing list. And um, is that right? Shane Bloom photo at yahoo.com, right, Michael? Yeah, that's where I'm posting everything. Um, and that won't change either. I'm going to switch web providers, I think, soon, but the web address isn't going to change. So what is your website? That was your email I was giving them because I said they needed oh, yes. to contact you to get on your email list. Oh, yeah, uh, shamelandphoto at gmail.com. But uh, the website, which you can even email me from the website, is shamebloomphoto.com or okay, milkywayphotos.com, which is right under, right here, I think. Yeah. yeah, there you go. That's great. Well, this has been wonderful, Michael, and we will, in the show notes, uh, get back to them with a time that you will come back with editing, because now we know how to pick a select a, a site we know the equipment and don't forget the t-shirt <laughs> and uh, then what this, the photos actually look like they're just amazing okay. so uh, thank you so much and uh, now we come to our part in the show where we have our recommended uh, photographers and um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Tom are you ready Who's ready? Who's got their site? I'm ready. Jim is? Yeah. Okay. So we'll just, tonight I'm going to recommend, recommend a photographer. Tonight I'm going to recommend Mason Cummings. And let me start the screen share. Um, he's a um, fine art landscape photographer in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, he's got a variety of material mostly in and around California, but not all. Uh, does landscapes and seascapes, color black and white. Um, he's pretty new to Google Plus and uh, only has a couple hundred followers, so if you like what you see here, um, by all means, check him out. Uh, he'll be in the show notes, and uh, hopefully uh, he'll get a lot of new followers. That's it. Great. Kevin, are you set? Yep, sure am. Okay, we'll go to Kevin and his recommended photographer. Okay, and uh, hopefully I say his name correctly. This is uh, Guy Schmickel, and uh, looks like he lives in Sedona. And uh, so that's down by uh, Jim and Cara. Yep. So. Right between us. Yeah, there you go. So. Uh, <laughs> posted this one uh, in the uh, landscape photography page today. This is a really nice shot. Um, so he's got some really great uh, shots, I think. So check him out. Wonderful. Thank you. Jeff, it looks like you're ready. I have a Michael R. Reynolds from Berkeley area. And here's a, uh, is that coming up? That's, yeah, uh, yes. that's, that's a Milky Way that he did. Uh, last weekend in Yosemite, and he has a number of other shots, some of them including the bristlecone pine area during the daylight that is an interesting complement to uh, the photos that Michael was showing earlier. So that's Michael R. Reynolds. Well, thank you. And um, so... I've got one, Cara. Okay. We'll get you over here. There we go. Are you seeing that one? No. Nope. No, we just see you. Let me try it one more time. Did we mention the pet gremlins? <laughs> oh, yes, the gremlins. We should actually name them. We didn't feed them tonight. <laughs> do, we, do you think they're males or females? <laughs> Obviously females. 
Ah, now who said that? Kevin. We're gonna we're gonna mute you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. Right. There we go. Uh, here's one. This is uh, John Caswell. Uh, he's a school teacher in New Zealand, and I think uh, fairly new to Google+. Uh, he only has like 700 followers, uh, but he just does a very wide range of work, even some portraits, uh, but an excellent photographer, and this one just really kind of spoke to me. Um, I'm not familiar with this landmark, so it must be a New Zealand kind of thing, but um, just does gorgeous work. So. Um, uh, not too many people know about him, so uh, jump on the bandwagon and uh, go check him out. You'll you'll enjoy his work. Thank you. And Tom, are you ready? I am. Okay. I had chosen a, a photographer, Paradigm Blue. Um, lives in Australia, and this is one of his shots. Um, he's got many night scenes of the of urban areas. And he always has such vivid colors, that, which I always enjoy. So, um, again, it's paradigm blue. And uh, this happens to be uh, two young boys he caught spray painting on a wall. Now, I, I think I understand why spray, spray cans are now locked up in California and you, you need to get somebody <laughs> to open, open it with a key. But this is my choice. Wonderful. Okay. And um, uh, Michael, did you have somebody you wanted to share with us? Yeah, sure. Um, one second. So um, I really like uh, Lincoln Harrison. Um, he lives in Australia. Uh, he's a great night sky photographer, and uh, you know, one of my inspirations for shooting this type of stuff. Uh, he's really like a pioneer, um, you know, in in shooting, you know, crazy nightscapes, you know, really captures just a great, you know, amount of detail in all of his photographs. Um, everything is really clean and crisp, and, you know, he's just able to retain so much, you know, color from the Milky Way. Uh, and, you know, he has some beautiful star trails, and he uses some really cool, unique techniques that, uh, you know, I think are, are really awesome, so... Oh, well, that's great. And uh, that was a question. I'm just going to finish up the, a couple of questions. Who were some of the photographers that inspired you? Yeah. Obviously, this is this one. Yeah, um, definitely him. Um, you know, there's a bunch of other photographers. Um, I don't know. All, all, all of my friends that I shoot with, uh, you know, Jeff Morris, who's in the chat, is a great astrophotographer. Uh, my friend Toby Harriman's a great photographer. I mean, you know, there's so many great photographers out there. It's hard to mention, you know, all the people that inspire me. You know, I, I go out and shoot with so many people, uh, you know, and every single time I shoot with somebody new, you know, I, I, I get to see a person's perspective on shooting, uh, and it's really great. You'll have to tell those people to um, share with the landscape photography theme. Um, yes. yes. So right. I think it's, uh, I don't know, the first or second top uh, uh, followed photography theme on Google+. Plus. So there's a huge right. following, and uh, they would love that kind of work. Cool. I'd just like to make one comment to Michael. The technical stuff is very interesting, but I find that your eye, your artistic eye is very strong. The compositions yeah. are striking. And very competent, and there's a real uh, a finished and uh, a very uh, masterful look to the uh, compositions, and the feet and the uh, you might call it the uh, the kind of a lyrical feeling to them that uh, they're they're very uh, captivating and very artistic images. So I I just like to congratulate you for that achievement. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. I try and you know. Uh, it, you know, there's a million different ways of doing the whole night sky photography thing, and you know, there, you can anyone can go out and just shoot the Milky Way, and I, you know, I'm I've been doing this for a little while now, and I just try and push myself creatively to think kind of outside the box with a lot of these scenes, like, you know, how would somebody shoot this? Well, you know, what's the complete opposite of that? You know, like what's <laughs> what's unique? What's different? What's you know maybe a little? Uh, I try and you know I. Anyone can get the technicals of how to do this stuff, but it's, you know, really pushing yourself creatively to, you know, make beautiful pieces of art. That's kind of what I'm 
trying to do, I guess, in, in those pieces. So thank you so much. Thanks for saying that. Oh, that's great. Well, we'll end with uh, the photographer that I have from um, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, his name is Gord Birch, and he, he does, Birch does participate in the landscape photography theme. He's also a curator for My City Sunday. He does some really unique kinds of things with his landscape photos, and um, he, they're just very crisp, and he has a very unique sense of humor. He's uh, putting together incredible packages about the history of his area, and uh, so he's doing that with his photographs and really creating a message about um, the, uh, the, lo the area and kind of the history. So, um, the Gord Birch. So anyway, I want to thank everybody for coming. We're um, not too far off of our, our time track, and really everyone was very inspired, Michael. Um, thank you, thank so you much. for sharing, sharing the whole process, because I think yeah. when you start from the beginning and we saw all of the um, locations with sunlight, and then to see what you do with your art, it really, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people inspired by watching this and wanting to go out and shoot night photography. So in our show notes, we'll get back with you uh, when we'll have Michael back for editing, because then you'll see the pictures and then how he actually did it. Um, we have Mark Johnson coming the end of October. Um, August back again on the 27th and so we're closing out tonight for episode 15 with uh, Michael Shane Bloom and we really appreciate uh, you coming and looking forward to watching your stream and all your zillions of followers. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So we're going to say good night and peace and we'll see you in two weeks on the 13th. Good night, everyone.